going to try to get through the, the particulars. We do have, uh, uh, and, and this is going to be at the at the council meeting, but Doug Beard. Doug, I'm going to ask you to just come up. I'm just going to ask you to come forward just for a minute. I'm not too good in prompting, so. Doug. I'm going to miss you. Yeah, I'm really <gasps> Brother. You know what, I'm going to torture you until the last day that you have to be on here, and I, I'm going to try to make this as uncomfortable as possible for you, Doug. <laughs> this is bulletproof. But, but, uh, <laughs> but what, a, what a blessing it has been. I, I want you to say something tonight, too. But, uh, Doug, um, you were the chief when I, when I got on city council. We've been through some, some rugged times together, and... Yeah. Uh, I remember one day you came and picked me up down at Park Place, yep. remember? And we yeah, had some absolutely. talking to do. And uh, <clears throat> you're, you're just going to be missed. It's, uh, it seems like, uh, I know you gave us a warning, but um, yeah. the hug beard I'll is say a little something after the meeting, but just grateful is all I can say. So. Thanks. Anybody want to say anything towards us oh, to Doug Beard before he sits down? I'm just start crying. Beard. All right, yeah. That joker, man. All right. So anyways, council, you guys have a green light to torture Doug as much as possible yes. until, uh, until he's out. Especially you, John Bills, because I know you're good. Okay. Uh, we have uh, Dennis Kramer, uh, Major of Operations, 30 years of service. We'll be recognizing that as well. Uh, next, we have a consideration of property locally known as 848 South Garfield Avenue, City of Burlington, Iowa, with conditions. Mr. Tisland. Show the property on the overhead here. This is a city the or a property the city acquired through the abandoned building program. There was a fire at this property on the structure. Uh, it was since demolished, and uh, we've had interest from both adjoining uh, property owners to the north and south in acquiring a portion of the lot. Um, there is a garage uh, still uh, remaining on the uh, northern portion of that lot that would go with the um, northern half of that lot. Um, but the, the property owner to the north uh, has... Uh, requested and the property owner of the south requested portion of the lot uh, splits approximately 29.5 feet uh, to the north and 23 feet to the south each is offered $500 for that um, for our usual process uh, properties vacant properties are either sold to adjacent property owners or someone who would have to build a new structure on the lot within 180 days so um, currently in the packet it, it's structured that it would be split uh, between the two adjacent property owners unless someone else came forward to build a new home. Any questions online? No. I, I don't have anything. I, I just would say that in the future, I'd, I think we could probably come up with some different ideas or plans to, to do things with these types of lots, but in this case, I think we're fine. Peanut butter popcorn. Okay, we're good. Uh, next, this is the time set for hearing for consideration of sale. Property locally known as 424 North 3rd Street, City of Burlington, Iowa, with conditions. Publication has been made, Mr. Tislin. <clears throat> this is the current police building uh, located at the corner of 3rd and Columbia Street. Uh, we have had or did list this property, um, I guess, previous council uh, through a real estate agent, uh, have had an offer on the property. Um, they're here going to speak as well. Trinity Hospitality Group. Um, some of the conditions on the property based on uh, what they're looking to do at the site uh, would be um, start demo or rehab uh, within 180 days of deed transaction from the city, uh, construct a hotel with a minimum of 30 rooms on the site. Uh, rooms shall include any rooms that, uh, located on the adjacent property as well at uh, 412 North 3rd. Uh, invest a minimum of $3 million in the uh, total redevelopment site, uh, including 424 and 412 and construction be completed within two years of start of work uh, listed. Uh, they would uh, need to lease back the property to the city um, for a term uh, no longer than August 1st, but uh, 60 days after substantial completion of renovation of the current uh, facility, uh, the former U.S. Bank site. Um, property transfer completed upon due diligence of the purchaser, um, and if the purchaser doesn't fulfill requirements of uh, Two, does not start demo or rehab within the 180 days that they would transfer back to the city with it for a dollar. So those are the uh, general conditions of it and they have comments or 
input? Council? Um, my name is Marty Bull, and I am. Are you? Yes, now or no? Issues, uh, yeah, come up. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> that's just getting out. Of, that's just getting out. Of easy. <laughs> yeah, you got to talk in the microphone. Darn it. Get your anyway, name address, please. Uh, my name is Marty Bull, and my husband and myself bought um, the Quality Inn here in town two years ago, and recently um, our partner Julie Lehman has joined us, and we formed Trinity Hospitality, and it has been our dream um, to own a. A, a boutique hotel downtown for the last couple of years we've been talking about that and it's really come into play now working with uh, uh, everybody here and um, we would love to see it come into play we've spoken to architects and have gotten um, some renderings and drawings kind of an ideas of going on and um, we're just really excited about that opportunity and would love to purchase the police station for a really really cheap amount so we can knock that thing down and um, build our dream hotel and make Burlington a better place to visit and uh, welcome people into our town and our community and just restore what it used to be and make it even even better. So that is our dream and our hope. And I don't know, Julie, do you want to say something about that or not? I just, think, um, I, I just want to let you know about our background a little bit. Obviously, they're hotel owners and have some experience with that. Chad is a a lot of business development and entrepreneurship experience. Um, I'm a, actually formerly a, a downtown development professional. I was the first Main Street director in Mount Pleasant. So I'm very um, familiar and on board with what DPI has been doing and what, what they will be doing in the future. Um, we're really excited to be a catalyst in the downtown. And so I guess that's all. Thank you. Do you guys have questions for us? Any questions? Just have a statement. Uh, first off, um, I knew that you were a rock star. I could tell by your socks. <clears throat> uh, secondly, if uh, I did want to say this, if if you guys get that to go through, I don't. I gave up my public singing, but have you ever heard the song? Uh, did you ever know that you're my hero? I'm, I'm gonna sing that. <laughs> I'm gonna sing that for you all. That's right. Uh -uh. That's it. But if we get this done, I'm gonna sing that. I uh, I think that would be awesome. You're not gonna stop me, Jim. From singing? Yes. <laughs> trying to stop me. He's just disconnecting your mic. <laughs> Council. Great project. Look forward to seeing it. How many uh, rooms did you say? We'd like to uh, shoot for 35. Okay, awesome. We have a, a sweet number that we can make some money and we feel like the Burlington can absorb. I think any more than 35 or 40 is, in our opinion, too many um, for Burlington for Burlington Hotel. And you also can't give that personal um, connection you want to have with your guests in a hotel hotel. You want to know everybody's name. You want to welcome them in differently than you would in a regular um, chain hotel. I do have one question. Does, does your plan... Maybe come back up to the... Sure. <clears throat> does your plan include anything with the building next to it? Yes, it does. So we plan okay. on purchasing the Moose building and then restoring that back to a beautiful, beautiful building and then <laughs> connecting a building next to it to get those 35 rooms that we're going to need. Okay. Mm -hmm. right. Thank you. Fantastic. We're good? I'm good. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Uh, next we have a resolution approving plans and specs for the 2017 Law Enforcement Center site work improvements. Thank you guys for coming down. Big Chief. Yeah, just briefly, that we're just going back out to the street or going back out to bid on the site work improvement to the back, the parking lot to the back. When we bid that with the original project, we had budgeted 60000 I think it came in at seventy two, So we didn't accept that bid. thought the spring would be a better time to put that back out. So the plans and specs are the same. Everything's the same. We're just, we didn't accept that bid. We thought it was more than what we could get it for. So we'll see. We'll see what happens with it. All right. Questions? No questions. Appreciate you not accepting that high bid, Chief. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Uh, next, we have a resolution approving an agreement between the City of Burlington, Iowa, and Alliant Energy Incorporated for all night lighting services on South 14th Street. Why am I still looking at yours? Mr. Good evening. Um, here's a request. Uh, the request is actually two street lights um, after reviewing uh, with the police department. Um, as you can see the map here, there, there are several different dots. Um, the yellow are existing street lights. Uh, the red are existing poles. Uh, my recommendation upon speaking with the police department is to install one street light 
on the uh, the north end of where the development is currently at. Um, it is fairly dark in that area. The church puts off quite a bit of light from its building, um, and then there's a yard light for the uh, farmstead, um, kind of off to the west and uh, south of the, uh, the of the church there. So my recommendation would be install one street light. Nick, do you have any elevation issues with the airport? That being with I the talked lineup? to them. There's no issues there. It's using an existing pole, so there's no issue there. You guys good? Yes. Good to say. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Mack. Uh, next, we have a resolution approving an agreement with Burlington Northern Santa Fe Railroad for easement, support, oversight, and general conditions for working in proximity to Burlington Northern Santa Fe Main Line during work on Mount Pleasant Street Bridge project. Woo. Yeah, quite a doozy. Um, the, this is an agreement with BNSF um, for one to do the work there, uh, but it also has packaged in um, a permanent easement, but also a temporary construction easement. Um, for some reason, there was never a permanent easement over top of the railroad or in their airspace. Um, and so in that package of information, we have a permanent easement or we're trying to get for a dollar and then a temporary construction easement that we're trying to get for a thousand dollars will be in some of their other area. Um, but the other requirements I've spoken about before, um, we always need a flag or anytime we're working within a certain proximity of the railroad, but this agreement expands a little bit upon that, um, where we will now need a construction manager um, on site as well for the duration of the project which uh, as I spoke before has a, a price tag of around two hundred and fifty thousand um, dollars we, we will not likely not be the people that write the check straight strictly to BNSF it'll probably be a bill that our contractor sees um, to get the proper permitting and having, having having those costs we will we will be paying for them but just not directly to BNSF um, I don't have BNSF signature yet on this. I was hoping because of letting dates, I could get council to approve this prior to um, and then have them approve it and we can get it on its way to the DOT. Council. I don't like it, but you gotta have it. The flagger, he's costing us $50,000 million, you know, to hold the flag. You said there's a $1,000 <clears> fee <throat> for the temporary Correct. Uh, easement. Is that, a, is that typical? Correct. We typically take the area, uh, the, the area affected by construction, um, and we take that times uh, a valuation um, based in the neighborhood okay. of what that is, and All then right. we take it and we give, we offer a, you know, this is, I would say this is probably pretty typical what we offer for a construction easement. Sometimes if we work out a deal where we're going to take care of some grading issues they have, it might be a little less, but this is not out of line. You guys good? Yes. Yep. Okay. Uh, next, we have a resolution approving. Hold on, let me make it big. A resolution approving the purchase of a temporary construction easement from a lot off Osborne Street, append number 11 32 329 003, for the construction of the Mount Pleasant Street Bridge project. Mr. Mack? And the, and the map that Eric threw up is actually, I think, of the of the wine guard, uh, I think that's the the wine guard piece that we need. Um, I might have misspoke before. I had a wrong piece of paper in front of me. I don't have the BNSF uh, easement. It's probably in your packet there. I grabbed the wine guard one. So as you see here, this is the wine guard parcel on the on the south here. Uh, wine, guard Re wine guard Realty owns that, and so this is a temporary construction easement. Um, and so this is the thousand dollars. The BNSF one is in your packet or it should be in your easement package. And I will get, get that information and talk about it next week. Unfortunately, I don't have it with me. Um, so this is very similar to the BNSF one um, where we have a temporary construction easement to, to do the bridge. Um, there's some other specifications that we've spoken with uh, the, only, the property owner about uh, some conditions about keeping the driveway accessible throughout construction. And we've agreed to that, or at least to put that on our contractor. So. This is really no different than the, the, the temporary easement that we're going to get from BNSF. We do have, a, we do have this approved, though, from the, the person we're purchasing it from. Good. Council? Good. Good. Okay. All right. Thank you, sir. 
Let's move to discussion items. Our first one is a presentation, uh, Indoor Recreation Facility, Greater Burlington Sports uh, Facility. Mr. Hutchinson. Good to be with you tonight, uh, Jason Hutchison. I'm your representative this evening for uh, the Greater Burlington Sports Facilities Group, which uh, is an independent board of, uh, of directors, and uh, some of the others had obligations tonight. So uh, you get me, but I wanted to give you an update tonight on uh, where we're at with the sports facility, um, provide you with kind of an alternative concept that has come forward, review some assumptions and then some next steps and, and uh, potentially get some uh, feedback uh, from behind you but, uh, or from you. But just as a, as a quick update, um, the, the plan, as has been uh, published, is two facilities. One that's a court facility. Chosen location would be the SCC campus. There's a rendering of the, the feel and flavor. The final building probably won't look exactly like that, but that kind of gives you a flavor for what that facility uh, would look like. And then uh, the other was the, the turf facility that was slated uh, to go in the uh, Raider uh, precast concrete building uh, out on, uh, in West Burlington on North Gear Avenue. And so uh, that was the concept. We actually took that concept to uh, bid. Uh, we um, uh, secured a purchase agreement on the site. We took that to bid. Uh, we had a number of local companies uh, bid on that. And then we moved forward, uh, selected the contractor, moved forward into design phase. One of the um, goals that we had in the design phase was some value engineering because, of course, we want to have the best building possible for the least amount of money possible, right? And not, not that we were skimping on everything, but we wanted to be as efficient as possible. And is there a way to value engineer the project so we could come in underneath the estimates on that project? And so as part of that value engineering process, there was an alternative plan uh, that came forward uh, that the group is, is uh, fairly excited about. So. Um, the, uh, and the alternative concept has been determined as kind of the preferred route, but we have a lot of due diligence to do on that. So what is the alternative concept? Um, what you're seeing right now is an image of uh, a portion of the recplex. So for some orientation, this is Broadway Street that kind of stubs there as you turn into the parking area. And this is the main gate of the, of the recplex. Uh, Made right is over here, and this is, this is division. So right now, there is, uh, there's a grassy area in between the parking lot and Division Street uh, that is used for overflow parking right now. If any of you have been out there on the weekends, uh, you, you're familiar with that site uh, um, very much. And so the alternate proposal that has come forward is for an air-supported structure, so a dome, uh, so to speak, to be constructed in that, in that area. And what you're seeing here are some uh, fire uh, lanes. It would have a, a hard building that would be used for concessions and restrooms and those sorts of things. But the, the goal behind the air-supported structure uh, in the in the Raider site, we were looking at a plain surface of roughly 40,000 square feet. So, um, and uh, we like that configuration. We were able to do a lot of things with that. This configuration would get us closer to 75,000 to 80,000 square feet of plain surface. In fact, it would be large enough that you could actually have a high school football field in there. Now, with the uh, dome structure, the air-supported structure, we can't get goalposts in there. We'd have to make it far larger to get goalposts in there. So I don't want you to think that we're, we're going to be playing football with goalposts in there, but that gives you some idea of the size of it. So uh, it, right now, it's um, this, this concept that I'm showing you, and we've not determined the exact size yet, but this gives you a flavor anyway. It's about uh, 335 feet long by 225 feet um, wide and so it's a it's a really good size structure and so you can see just some preliminary drawings in here you could have a, a one large soccer field as an example with with goals on on each end here you can also corn that off into some smaller plane surfaces so you could have eight plane surfaces within that of a certain size you could have four plane surfaces of another size and there are all sorts of different size configurations based upon the tournaments that we might want to recruit whether it's um, you know five on five or seven on seven or, or those sorts of things and so one of the uh, attractions of going down this route is that plane surface 
uh, area, and, and that's um, maximizing that is pretty important. You see there's some, some room for some seating on here. We may or may not have uh, uh, bleachers on there, and we're still working out the configurations of this, but a, a very large facility. And we can do this for, um, it's, uh, it's going to be a little bit more than we were planning on, but uh, you know we're probably talking somewhere in the neighborhood of, of $250,000 or so more than our other design, which was half the square footage. So to give you some idea on a cost for, per square foot, we would be driving that rate down pretty substantially. And so again, we've not determined the size because there are a couple of steps that, that uh, we need to do yet. But this also shows you an idea. The uh, structure itself would be 67 feet in the air. So uh, that's, that's the side. There would be a small cement wall on one side, a small cement wall on the other side, and then that air supported structure peaking at 67 feet. So it would be a massive change to the landscape in that area. And anyone coming to the RecPlex for an activity during the summer will have no will no doubt see that there's a, a facility to, to play sports in during the winter time as as well. So um, a lot of the assumptions that we have been operating under don't change. So uh, we would still like the nonprofit entity to own the air supported structure. If this alternative route works out and you are agreeable to it, it's it's land that the city of Burlington owns in the city limits of West Burlington. Um, our goal would probably be to lease that ground from you and still have the nonprofit entity own the building itself on that leased ground. Um, <clears throat> the turf and court buildings, they would still be two separate facilities as part of one project. So they might not go up simultaneously at the, at the exact same time, but they're still, the plan is still to do both facilities as part of this overall project. And then again, the turf facility, just like the court facility, would be operated from the nonprofit entity. So, you know, of course, you get the wheels turning. And if this were located on the Recplex campus, does it make sense to have some consolidated management and things of that nature? Well, I think that's worthy of conversation uh, uh, down the road. It is the intent. We've always intended for this to be privately operated and and uh, and not necessarily become a city government function. And so that's our preference as a group is to still have this privately operated, but certainly, especially with being on the RecPlex campus, we would want really good communication, cooperation, and interactivity with, with city staff out there because these two function, these two uh, venues would have to coexist and I think could cooperate really, really well. We could get some synergies uh, from that. So what's left in kind of the due diligence uh, phase? So we need to determine the exact size. Some of that's going to depend on, on the cost. Uh, we may want more, but we don't know what we can afford yet, right? We're still in fundraising uh, mode, and, and every dollar more that it costs is another dollar that we need to raise, uh, and also the market potential. So we're still evaluating uh, the market for this facility. <clears throat> we think, based upon talking to tournament organizers and folks in that space, that this facility is going to dramatically increase the economic impact. We think that you know by uh, doubling the square footage, it will actually bring significantly more economic benefit because of the style of tournaments that we can have and the number of teams that we would be able to have in a single tournament because of that additional playing surface. <clears throat> so it's proposed to be on the overflow parking area. So what do we do about overflow parking? Uh, we, we have to come up with a, a plan for that, and, and I want to commend uh, city staff for uh, quickly responding to this with, um, with some concepts to review. And I think Nick's going to come up in just a bit and, and talk about um, a concept that has been tossed around to, to replace that, that parking. And then, <clears throat> uh, again, um, this is your ground, so it only happens if, uh, if you're agreeable to it and we can work on some sort of a lease. And so that's a step that we would have to work through to determine is this the right thing for the project or, or not. But that discussion has to start somewhere, and so we're kind of kicking that off tonight. Uh, again, collaboration with the existing management out there. And then, of course, we have to raise the, the capital necessary. Our overall um, capital goal is, is $10 million. Joe O'Brien is, uh, is with me tonight. He's been kind of our lead fundraiser on that. Every day, additional calls are being made, and this community is responding very favorably. They're being very generous uh, with their, their time and their financial commitments to this project. Uh, but we aren't at the goal yet, so we have, we've got a little bit of work to do there. <coughs> Excuse me. So the current request before you is just some initial feedback um, on this. This is an alternative uh, plan. We're in due diligence. If we uh, 
if it doesn't look like this plan is going to move forward, that's okay. We'll go back to the, the other plan, but we need to at least do our due diligence and, and determine some, from, some feedback from you on, is this a road worth continuing to pursue, or is this alternative plan not meeting the, uh, the needs of the community? Um, future requests, these are unchanged by, by the way. Uh, every time that the group has been before you, we've said w there will probably be a time where we come forward and, and seek uh, overall financial support for the project, and then also, uh, support for um, uh, the capital improvements fund to that. We don't want to be in a position where these facilities get built and there's no plan to replace the depreciation or the assets that, that deplete over time in that building. And so what we have always talked about potentially visiting with you about capturing some of that growth in hotel motel tax that will occur as a result of these facilities um, for future improvements years down the, the road. So. And that's unchanged. We're not before you formally requesting that, but these things I, I, I want to um, put out there, they've always been a part of the, the plan. So um, with that, I guess maybe, Nick, do you want to talk a little bit about that alternative parking plan, and then I'd be happy to take any questions that, that you might have. Oh, Eric, sure. throw this, this conceptual map up on the overhead here. Um, as you can see, there's, there's two different things, or three different things going on. Um, in the past, we've talked about the extension uh, for the Broadway and McCampbell Drive um, as a RISE grant application. That was nice, man. <laughs> it was all, I can't take credit for that. It was him. I thought it was a nice little place to that throw that nice, in there. That was nice, man. Um, and that's going over to Mason, right? That would be Division Two West Burlington oh, Avenue. Division West Burlington. Okay, yep. sorry. And so that would be a RISE grant application. Um, in that conversation, we talked about potentially getting some parking sl slipped in there uh, because it's still part of the roadway. As you can see, I don't, I think he's estimated about 43 spots. Um, along with doing some additional work on the east side of our current drive. Um, but the parking that, that we're talking about is off to the east of, of what Broadway is now. Um, in this about 253 estimated spots and the price tag that Jesse came up with was about seven hundred seven hundred fifty thousand dollars for that um, it's fairly substantial but um, it's kind of the kind of the realm of what we're talking about for money for a parking lot that size um, after talking with Jim I don't think we have that much money um, and that we would probably dial it back you maybe want to take over from the money side financially the I mean, we don't have any magic pots to come up with funds to make this happen. We do have one source of funds, though, that is coming up this year that is um, not a, a budgeted amount. Um, it's uh, the second half payment for the uh, manor property. Uh, we'll be receiving s sometime this year $1.2 million. Now, out of that, we have two different things, and I noted one in the, uh, later in the council packet, uh, my kind of summary of of uh, the budget, um, an item for downtown parking has been brought up for potentially needing to be able to provide if uh, the sale of the two pr properties in the downtown area were to go and needing to develop a hundred some spots there. Uh, cost estimate for that parking on the BNSF land was 650000 So if you think of $1.2 million and we could potentially look at two different things that we could make that cover. Um, the 650 for the downtown, and that would leave 550 out here. So, as we're ta we've talked internally in terms of where what could we realistically afford to do for something that we don't have identified funding to make happen, we do. This is a source of funding for in that neighborhood of 550 thousand. Now, so how do we deal with something that you're presenting at 750? So the way I think you approach that on this parking lot is you you dial it back in the number of spots, and you I haven't talked to you about this, but make the the grass area or the the untreated surface around it available for parking, similar to what we have now, um, where the dome would go, and even to the west uh, where we put a put a lane in. Um, I don't know what that number is. Um, at the 550,000, um, but I could get that pretty quick. Like, I just wanted to bring you kind of a general concept <clears throat> of what that parking, sh this kind of parking would look like, and kind of the cost parameters that it would be. And part of what we've also looked at this isn't our land, so this is something that we still need to work with. Uh, what's the formal title? I'm sorry, Grow Jason. Greater Burlington. Grow Greater Burlington to. Uh, 
um, acquire the land and, and um, as we don't have additional funding to, to make this happen, what kind of arrangement was are potentially is potentially out there, Jason, to make this kind of thing happen? Yeah, so certainly, uh, and I'm wearing two hats, so I'm switching to uh, the, the economic development hat. You know, we've been very supportive of this project and, and want to see this project happen. So I don't have authority to come here today and say, that land will be available and it will be available at no cost but uh, because our board has not discussed that but I can tell you that our board is is supportive and, and it's certainly a request that we would we would visit with them we have visited you know about the road and we have a, a, a long history and a partnership of of ensuring that land is available for infrastructure uh, out there and so I would uh, we would probably maybe adjust the position of this lot so there are lots of things to consider here. One is you're replacing grass parking with concrete parking. And I think we would all agree that uh, it would have been great to pave all that parking uh, years ago, but we never did. And so is now the right time to, to pave that parking? Uh, it could be. There's going to be a cost associated with that. And then, um, you know, does is that the right spot or is it further south? I think we would our board would want to work with uh, with the city on that to make sure that we have the maximum amount of land available for job creation and development projects. But So this is a very fluid topic, I think, is what we're kind of getting at here. We do have some funds that are available to help make, some, make a transition happen, but they are limited. So I've got a plethora of questions. My first one is, um, I know you're in the, the discovery phase still on this, right. but the biggest question I'm going to have for you is, you talk about economic impact and a significantly better economic impact yep. with the larger facility. What's that mean? What's significant? Is it is it an expected hundred and fifty thousand dollars of revenue annually, or is it ten? So those are some numbers that I'm gonna uh, I'd like to see before we were to commit to anything. The next thing is Nick, as far as the roadway goes, I know the safer grant. Uh, if we include the parking, will assist in. in getting us some of the spaces we need, but it, would it be better to uh, to try and maximize that and, and add more parking along the entire roadway in order to take advantage of the leveraged money? And then also, um, uh, Jason, does the parking lot that exists or in this diagram, will that conflict with any future development of that lot? And I know that that's something that the chamber or, or Grow Burlington uh, would like to be able to market uh, is there going to be any conflict there? Uh, uh, with the place, if this were to be the size that everyone were to sign off on of a parking um, uh, lot, I would probably seek to move that down to this corner and have it located here. That would preserve this corner, this entire corner for development, which um, I'd like to see. If it turns out we need parking all, all this way, well, then, then that's what's needed. But if that's the size, I'd probably like to see that shift down. It just maximizes our potential on that large. This is a, uh, a Silgan Containers-esque size of lot, right, just like right. across the street. And we want to preserve as, as much of that as, as possible. Shaving off a corner probably is not going to impact development substantially. Um, well, so. Plus the fact that if you move it south, you can actually have a second entrance at some point in time to alleviate traffic to in front of the, the rec flex zone. So, on, in regards to some of the other discussion on the, um, including in the its rise grant, a couple of terms safer. Um, safer it had to do with the funding source for, for firefighters. Fire, I, I read that um, packet, so I had it on. Yeah, <laughs> rise uh, immediate opportunity. I'm not. I can't think what rise stands for that DOT uses the, that acronym for. It's. It's, uh, it's a DOT. It's DOT. It's for economic development opportunity. This is a prospective one. They have two different pots of money. Um, if you have something such as when we had Silgan Containers come in, we, had, we used RISE funding there uh, for job creation, and it was 80% state funding. This is speculative, um, helping a roadway be improved to, for future development in that area. It's 50% funding. It's okay. still, it's, it's a different level of competition. It's something that we can wait uh, to and submit at a, on an application cycle where it looks like it can be competitive and, and have a chance to be funded. Um, we talked about additional parking on the road and a couple of things that came up. It's on, the only spot where we really have the ability to have it with RISE funding would be in the portion that uh, is new road. 
and we also talked about location versus uh, proximity to the um, rectplex. We don't want it to be any farther south than what you see for the spots identified there uh, around the corner. Uh, we talked about the whether you would want it on just the west side as is configured here or the potentially west and east side. And as we talked about um, having people park on the east side of that new road and now you have people crossing the street the whole length versus uh, trying to have that controlled more to the main entryway with a, a controlled crossing. Uh, we felt a whole lot more comfortable about that. Plus we weren't exactly sure how uh, how well the state would look at the idea of what would end up being 70 foot uh, paving area or getting into that neighborhood as we talked about some different configurations. Uh, we, we wanted to make sure that we kept it in a way that was still going to be competitive for funding with sure, RISE. Makes sense. You good? Man? Yeah. yeah. Jim, I've got a question for you. Um, where's the, the money that you're going to be using for this parking? What, what was the intended purpose of that money? The, man, the, the manor money. We don't have a, so the, the Manor project was originally funded uh, with, uh, the debt was with TIF financing. Um, however, as, pro as the, for the repayment uh, with the sale of land, there's no requirement for where it goes. Um, what I would have otherwise used this towards um, potentially looking to not have as much borrowed for, say, the Mount Pleasant Street Bridge, reducing a TIF project, but this is also a viable source. Um, one of the things with parking, and I've expressed to Jason, when it comes to use some things that you could potentially use TIF financing for, uh, parking is certainly one that you can use it for. It's not one that I would prefer to if I could ha have a different source, though, um, it's I, so I, I guess uh, when you talk about identified funding, this is just this is a piece of funding that is available to do uh, something with uh, the funding that we have coming in. Uh, if it wasn't used for this, I'd say we'd be using it to reduce our TIF obligation on another project. I mean, to me, it's all semi-relative, just because I mean it's based off of whatever the economic or proposed economic benefits going to be with this project versus the Raider project and I mean if we have to spend money in order to make money well that's what we got to do but um, I, I, I just, uh, we'll I'd just I'd also no I'd also put out <laughs> have to um, this well I mean it, d depending the, on the the amount it, I mean it would make sense <clears throat> paving here uh, as we've talked about coming up with a need for parking in a different spot if you put this in if the the indoor facility goes there, we, we are in a position where we ha need to do this at this point. However, this is, I think when I started, Eric, you were already talking at that point about the need to be considering long-term a different parking solution for what we're doing out there because the surface out in that parking lot is... It's a muddy field. It's a, it's a muddy field and it's, get, it's getting compacted and just can't take that long-term continuing to, to do parking the way we were. Uh, so this was something that was really is been necessary to consider getting some additional paved parking out in that area. However, this project has exacerbated the timeline if it were to move forward for getting it done. So it, I, I guess I want to make sure that, that everybody understands you've got a project that is push, forcing your hand if it were to move forward in terms of what you're doing with parking but it is not all the needs for this new project that is driving the need to consider parking over time too. Driving, you like that? Well, and the, the, the other project they mentioned downtown, the, the 650, that's not set in stone that that's happening. Nope. In fact, the, I mean, they extended that closing deadline to March. Um, but they everything's looking like they're moving forward with it. They've continued to spend money on uh, design work on that, um, and they everything looks like they're planning to close, but okay. they, I mean, they haven't. So, I mean, I, I look at this project and I say, 
I mean, every community across the country is working on building or expanding outdoor recplex facilities because that's one of the major waves that's going on right now. People are joining traveling teams, and, and that's bringing a lot of money into communities like ours. And when I look at this project, I say, well, this is us doubling down on trying to maximize the ability of that facility, uh, in order, and eventually it will pay dividends. And so uh, it's one of those things, like I said, if, if we're going to look at doing it and it requires a, a – a parking lot well I need to know what the the net benefits going to be above and beyond what's already planned I just think we need to also consider though to um, when you say is in uh, Dublin down um, how is our how is our first initial one going and that's that's what I'm going to take into context as well is uh, how is the outside how's the outside one going and is that is this going to come back and be a, a burden later you know, on the city, that's a pretty big, that's a big, that's a big building. So um, I just think uh, moving forward, we ought to make sure that we've got every, all the information that's, you know, that's, that's possible to have just because, yeah, once that, once that starts rolling downhill, man, it's, it's rolling downhill. There's, you know, there's no stopping that. So I just think we need to make sure it's the right thing to do. It's the right investment. That's a lot of money we could put somewhere else. I'm just, I'm just saying, not that I'm against it. I just indoor I mean these are going to be uh, different uh, financial uh, structures for how things are done the the outdoor recplex is solely the city um, and Eric will cover uh, how operations have gone I think I have some written in the in my notes on this um, Eric will address what's what's gone on with numbers over the course of the last few years during his presentation and um, Kind of the long and short, we're we're going to be putting we're we're continuing to put more money into that than what we orig what we have over the past few years. Uh, we were on a trend where we were putting thirty five to forty thousand annually in for operations. This year we budgeted seventy. Uh, this next year, the budget that we're proposing to you, uh, we've allocated one hundred and ten thousand. That might be more than what's necessary, but. I'm not sure how much off that is. I want to make sure that I've protected what we need to, to have there. Uh, that being said, you can the if you were to look at our hotel motel revenue as for one, um, well, it's down from what it was two years ago. But you look at it comparatively to other communities our size. We have we're we still benefit from this facility from that facility. Uh, our revenues in the hotel motel sector and the restaurant sector are significantly above what you would see for comparable communities on average. Um, it has a, a huge benefit on our community besides its availability for usage by uh, local residents um, along with the tournaments from outside teams. I and I think you'll find the same thing occurs with an outdoor, with an indoor facility. And I'm sorry, John. I got, no, let's cut you off. Sorry. Go ahead. Um, operationally, I mean, the city, as the owner of the outdoor recplex, has the responsibility to make operations work. If there's any shortfalls, we're covering it. The arrangements that they that the the indoor recplex committee has in place, the facility itself is covering it. We're we're not a, a signatory on anything. We're not backing anything. Uh, the local motels have come together and agreed to help set up a side fund to help uh, cover those long-term operational costs. Not to say that the chamber or the group isn't going to be coming to us with this discussion. As you see, the two other items that were on his request list, one for cash going into it, which I would argue right now we don't have much funding to, to make happen if, we, if these other projects occur, the sources that I would say that we have some flexible money are gone. Um, but if you take a look at um, look at the project and what the potential is for growth in hotel motel I think there's an argument that could be made that it makes sense if you carve out a base level uh, is the existing operations of hotel motel collections um, this goes into place and you have now collections go up 20 percent is there a portion of that that you could say is directly attributable to the newly created indoor recplex and I think that that's a an argument that can be made and you could say we're willing to put aside a percentage of that growth specifically towards this facility um, even but but that's still an argument that's not saying that we're backing any losses 
on it. The losses are not the city's. So this is a, a different structure, a different and I just want to well, make sure that you understand. That's why it makes great sense to do it, because our risk is minimalized by the fact that it's being owned and operated by a private firm. So you're still going to have something to do with that. But I'm we're going to we'll obviously have the cost of a, of a parking lot. Um, well, no, I'm saying an upkeep and, and uh, snow removal, all of that stuff. I mean, so, I mean, it's not like... Snow we're, removal is something as this is... We're, we have not talked operationally about how this works, and we still have to have those discussions occur. Um, one thing that we mentioned after uh, the last meeting that we had with, with you, Jason, um, you know, during the winter, we typically don't do snow removal on that lot. Well, that's going to be something that has to happen, and... We're going to have to have a discussion. That's not one of the costs that we typically think of as being ours. So we're going to be wanting the this new facility to cover, have that responsibility, some level of discussion about that. And there's going to be other things that come up. Part of that kind of discussion is also going to have to be you have the an outdoor complex and an indoor complex next to each other. How much crossovers are there? And how are we going to make that kind of stuff happen? That's that's a discussion that's well down that's the road, good, yeah. mm -hmm. yeah. um, but it's it's going to be something that will be be there as this proceeds. If you're willing to let this proceed, well, as a business person that that had a business that used to be directly affected by the Recplex traffic, I can tell you I, I can tell you without looking at the calendar when there was a tournament in the Recplex because we were busy with out of town traffic. Um, and it, so it goes beyond the hotel motel tax. Mm -hmm. It goes it. it it really is a, a great thing for our community. I would say that, yeah, our money, our, 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 our bucks in is probably would be a parking lot at this point in time because we don't have more than that to give. But I, could, I definitely think it is something we have to really strongly consider. Uh, it keeps us in the game. On, and we've had a little bit of attrition on some of these uh, tournaments. Having an indoor facility when the weather is lousy could be a real advantage. I do think one of the things that would have to be discussed first is the management of it as far as the combined management with the city and, a, and, a, and a, a private facility. I think our staff does an excellent job at the RecPlex. However, it has been my experience that typically there is, if we could combine that management, uh, there might be a way to do that cheaper. And uh, so that might be something we would have to look at and, and discuss that up front. Um, but I love the project so Jim just to make sure I understood you correct did you say that, that we have already looked at or are currently looking at paving portions of that space now uh, because of the fact that of the wear and tear that's on the ground you've what, what kind of discussions have you We've had there had different discussions especially on the drive lanes about paving them uh, that parking <coughs> area to the be the northwest of the uh, by the soccer fields we've paved an entry drive into that and mm -hmm. The driveway needs to be extended, and this is another area that is a higher traffic use. That, that's kind of the minimum standard is at least the drive lane, similar to the Bees Stadium, uh, trying to accomplish that. Okay. So, yes, we have looked at different things that were going to require us to spend some money for parking. So, so, I mean, whether we did it, I mean, I'm not saying we're doing it right now, but at some point in time we were going to spend some money on these types of projects anyways. So, Maybe not to the extent that this is. Right. But. You guys good? I know nobody's good, but are you guys are you ready to move forward then? I'm excited about this project as a an end user. I have boys that live, breathe, eat sports. We have driven thousands of miles to other facilities because we don't have what we need here in Burlington. Um, lots of dollars going out the window by a lot of teams not being able to find what they need here and that's hotel dollars and food dollars and gasoline dollars and uh, you can keep you know checking the, the dollar signs but this is a good thing for Burlington a great thing for our community and I am super psyched about it myself Wow she's super psyched you know <laughs> O'Brien look O'Brien just actually smiled the whole time he's been sitting there he's been stone-faced the whole time and he finally cracked his smile all right well, I know that I know we do need more parking there, just because of everyone's always parking on, um, you know, that soft, soft part. I would rather see it go towards offsetting costs on another uh, project. But that being said, that is something that we we need there, not even for an indoor sports. 
complex, but for our current um, our current recplex, and I think I wonder how many people are discouraged by the lack of parking and things like that when it comes to that area and that facility. And that, you know, who knows? I don't know, but at least to keep from tearing up the ground and some sort of parking, whether it's a fully paved or something like the bees have, because that seems to, I don't, I don't know anything about their parking lot, but that seems to work out nicely. And, and that's know. something that, as we've had discussions um, on uh, the bees does not, doesn't see the type of use that parts of ours does uh, as consistently as ours does. Um, so the dis some of that discussion is where, how much can you get by with doing that? Could you do a portion of a lot that is fully paved and a portion that is just the lanes mm -hmm. um, to try to like expand the yeah. amount of parking that's available and yet keep it within a budget? It's two different seasons, though. I mean, the bees are obviously typically playing during the summer months when it's drier, and in the winter it's going to be nothing but soggy, wet field that's just going to get torn up as a result of traffic. So I don't know that that scenario is necessarily applicable in this, in the, with this project. But I, like I said, I do like the project. I think it is doubling down. Um, if we see a decrease in the number and the amount of traffic at our facility, I think the that's a result of other communities building outdoor rec plexes and, and other baseball teams and, and parents having alternative places to go. And that's the correlation for me. And this is basically us doubling down and saying we're going to bring that activity back to Burlington because there's not very much very many facilities that I'm aware of in our area that have uh, an out or an indoor uh, space. So, well, the thing I like about it is that if you're talking at, at some point in time, you're going to have to put parking in anyway. This this solves a connection need. This solves a parking need, and you're doing something with the facility that might bring in some revenue. Whereas before, if we were just going to pave the parking where everybody's parking now for a safety reason, you're not doing any of those things. So in that regard, I, I, you know, I, I see where that's a win all the way around there. So. I just want to say I'm a little nervous. Uh, I think you know that about the indoor. Um, uh, not saying that I'm not for it, but I am. Uh, I am personally. I'm nervous moving forward. I'll just leave it at that. I'm not going to say much more because I think O'Brien will start giving me looks, man. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I just think we need to make sure we think everything through. But. Uh, it's good to see that we're still trying to move forward, man. Let's uh, let, let's keep doing it. So 18, bro. Any other any other questions for Jason? Oh, thank you. What's your expected start? Do you have guys have a rough start date for this project? Well, every day that passes <laughs> is a day that we're not recruiting uh, teams to spend money here, right? And so um, this guy, this guy, you know. Uh, our group has, so obviously there's lots of due diligence and we've got a lot of things to figure out, but I do not want to miss another winter sports season. Okay, that's all right? I need to hear. And so <laughs> there is, there's substantial urgency. So our, our goal in coming with you, to you tonight is to at least brief you on kind of what's happening. If you all said this is the worst idea ever, then we probably wouldn't continue it. Uh, I'm not hearing that. And so I think what that means is a lot of the questions that you have raised, it's time to start ironing out some of those details and then come back to you and, and really move this forward. And so I think what I'm hearing is that there's at least enough interest for us to continue to pursue this alternative plan and then make it just make a determination for the community is it the right thing to do or or not and um, we've not gotten feedback from the public yet because we're just starting down that road so i also like the fact that it preserves the other building for maybe development down the road for a for a manufacturer of some sort so that's, <coughs> that's good you guys good great all right thank you Thank you for coming. Next time you come, uh, leave O'Brien at home, man. He's got a really mean face. But we love you, though. We love you, Joel. All right. Uh, discussion item number two. <clears throat> Does anybody have any, uh, let's see, we have a low rent housing um, uh, committee appointment. Anybody have any problems with that? No. no. Good, be because she's going to be good. That's right. Thank you, Mr. Ranker. Okay, uh, discussion item number three. Uh, part of that is the city council appointments following elections. Some of those are positions that go with mayor and then uh, mayor pro tem positions, so they are automatically filled. But 
the other ones on that list. That's page 90 of your packet. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, need people to volunteer to take them if, it, if you want to work your way down that list. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Convention and Visitors Bureau. It was held by Bob Fleming. I'll do it. Can we hear when the dates are? That's right there. Third, yeah, I'm sorry, I should have went ahead and did that, but that's the third Tuesday at 7.30 a.m. Uh, no, yeah, third Tuesday at 7.30 a.m. I can't make that a little bit louder, louder, bigger. So, John Phillips? Sure. Okay, uh, Downtown Partners? I'll do that one. Okay. Um, and still there, let's see. Well, uh, Southeast. Does Annie, were you going to stay on solid waste? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. If you got some other ones, I was just going to go through and wanna, get the. Do you want to get rid of economic development? Um, no. Get rid of, okay. Get rid of this, maybe not the right time. <laughs> do okay. you want to get rid of it? <laughs> 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 okay. Well, uh, do you want to stay on that board? <laughs> <laughs> right. No, I'm good with that. Okay. <laughs> you got to get rid of it. <laughs> okay, man, this is going to be a good year. All right, um, Southeast Iowa Homeless Coordinating Board. That was Davidson's. That's every third Friday, uh, every other third Friday. Anybody? What? Which one? Southeast Iowa Homeless Coordinating Board. You skipped What did I skip, bro? A lot of you, you stopped at economic development. Uh, I'm on the regional planning. I, I took that back in November. I'll, I could take the alternate on that. Okay. Let's go with me. And so then we would be at renewable. Well, energy. resource enhancement, that's already that's already covered. Where you where you uh, at? Well you're at re I see, you're skipping ahead. Sorry. My fault. Okay. Are we still on the same page then? Me. Yeah, now you're okay. Okay. I'm not okay. Well, <laughs> but anyways, thanks. Man. All right. So Southeast Iowa Regional Planning uh, Board, um, that's every fourth Thursday at twelve PM. That's me. Regional plan. I'm Southeast regional planning. Iowa I took that from Jim. You already have. You already have yeah, that. I've, one. I've got that one, and Matt's going to do the alternate on it. He just won't. Okay. Here. So then, where do you? Southeast. Agree? Okay, Southeast Iowa homeless coordinator. There we go. Right back there. <laughs> oh my gosh. All right. So Southeast Iowa homeless coordinating board. That was Jim Davidson's. It's every third Friday. It's every other third Friday. Anybody interested in that? Two o'clock. I would be, but the time doesn't work for me. There's that one, and there's also a cap one, David. And that's every third Tuesday at 11 for Southeast Iowa Community Action. That's to be determined, and I'm, I, uh, I need to find out how, how much that board is meeting. Let's come back to that one. I could take the Burlington Bees if that's where you're headed next. I might fight you for that one. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let's do uh okay. I'll be alternate then. Let's do the let's do the Burlington Bees Association. Let's go ahead and get after that one. That's every last Friday at twelve PM at the Bees Park. And who's I can do that and then I'll Linda wanted to alternate. You good? Okay. I'll check into the, the homeless coordinating board. I, I'm, you can do that I'm just one. not sure about Oh, you can't. I can okay, do it. Yeah. It, okay. It's the community action, and they've been asking me okay. to. I don't think they the meet regularly, community. so it's not going to be a. The health insurance. It's not going to be a super demanding one. Okay. Um, the uh, uh, Cobco. So, so Cobco, for those who don't know what Cobco is, no um, the county. City County um, put on that one. Health Insurance. Oh, it's a that. coordinating oh. board that oversees <laughs> that. Has representative <laughs> from uh, yeah. both entity. It has representation from both the city and the county, as well as an other uh, you bet. one person but. from one employee group member and one uh, representative from the other entities in the county or region that are part of it. Okay. That's what I just thought about. Yeah, I can do that. Okay, so you're Rinker. You're good for Copco. It only makes yeah. sense. It's my line of business. So. <laughs> as soon as I, I thought about that, I was Thank like, you. Yeah. Bless you. And then, okay. uh, uh, Descom Control. What's, what's that? Descom Control. That's the uh, emergency oh, control the emergency. center. Okay, yeah. that's what I thought it was. Uh, I, it depends. It says to be decided. 
I would be willing to serve there, but, but it's, it's going to depend on when they do the meeting. They meet about twice. It's random about two or three times a year. Oh, I'll do that. Okay. I can do uh, the Greater Burlington Sports Commission. I wish you could. I that. could do that one. That one sounds fun. You'd like the Sports Commission? Yeah. Let's put let's put peanut butter popcorn on the uh, Sports Commission. So, okay, so did we address uh, and we took care of the homeless coordinating? Who is that? Yeah. Okay. Huh? Who is that? The Linda said she would do that. Okay. So we're good. Yep. And we've got Rinker and Cobco. That's going to be fun. I want to sit through one of those meetings. <laughs> okay. We'll be, we'll be taking. You might change your mind. <laughs> yeah. All right. Okay, uh, discussion item number three, we'll turn that over to uh, James. And see how long I can talk and bore you all to death. It won't, it won't take long for the boredom part, but go ahead, James. Please continue. Used, my kids will agree with that. <laughs> so will my wife. Um, in well, is O'Brien's still here. <laughs> <laughs> Nervous. So in your packet, there you do have a lot of background information. Uh, for this part, we just kind of do some of the background pieces that help to um, set the overall structure of the budget. The departments will go into their individual line items over the course of the next few weeks. Um, but just a, like in your packet, uh, page 93 has a fiscal year 2019 budget presentation overview. Um, this is something that we put in each year. Uh, a list of some of uh, the goals of the budget and then some of the factors that have impacted us over the last year and uh, items to consider as we do this specific year's budget. Um, so a lot of the information is very comparable from year to year in here. Um, but just going over uh, goals of the budget, um, some of these are just what I think of as being important. Timely communication of issues in a fair and open manner. Uh, trying to balance needs of all community members, ensure that we're in compliance with requirements imposed on us from a state and federal level, ensure that we honor all contracts and agreements that we've previously agreed to, uh, only have deficit account balances occur in projects that are not complete with a plan for eliminating, eliminating them at project completion. Uh, we've been working since well, since 2012, we established a goal to get to the 15% general fund balance as well as uh, some identified targets for fund balances and other funds. Um, and we're getting close to that. We were at 14.5% at the end of 14, or fiscal year 17. Uh, we're projected to be at 14.7 at fiscal year end of fiscal year 19. Um, maintain our core services, ensure that employees receive adequate training and that they have appropriate equipment for their safety, um, that we make sure that we don't uh, not replace equipment in a manner that ends up leading to higher uh, repair costs than what we would other than what it what makes cost effective sense. Um, bring on new capital projects funded by debt service in a manner that allows debt issues to be paid for in a consistent manner and ensure that annual usage of debt falls within a planned ladder of issues. This is part of our financial policies uh, that keeps us from violating our usage of our debt capacity or threatens our ability to issue future debt or places our debt levy at too high of a property tax le level. The budget that's being presented is based on a debt service levy of $3.84, which it's been at for the last four or five years, uh, with a long-term goal to see an average new debt issuance funded by property taxes, um, about one and a half to two million of, of debt taken on out of the, that general fund or out of that property tax levy, uh, which should be able to be done uh, with a $3 property tax asking. We're if we've been at 384 over the course of the last five years, we're going to be at that level for at least the next five. And for for backdrop, the debt issue that was done in fiscal year 11 uh, was backloaded. Uh, it created a, a debt structure that me meant that we had to stay at a higher debt debt levy to take on any projects at that point. We refinanced an awful lot of debt at that point. Uh, increased our levy to 384 that gave us the capacity to pay for that 
uh, to get rid of a lot of the deficit accounts that we had as well as create the room and flexibility to, to bring on new debt in a, in a, in a more of a ladder formation. So as debt goes off the books, uh, we issue new debt. Um, as we get to that fiscal 23, we can begin to look at that process of transitioning the debt levy down. So those are some just some ba basic goals that we have. Um, changes since the last last budget was approved. Well, part of it within the police department, we budgeted for two new positions to come on. Um, over the last couple of years, uh, the budget before, we budgeted for one new position to come on and leverage that to get funding for a second officer. Um, that funding that we had that helped to fund then those two positions will terminate partway through this next fiscal year, fiscal year 19 that our budget is for. So it'll, it'll help to pay for the off, those two positions in the next year, uh, but uh, we're gonna have some issues moving forward with that. Uh, we did bring on the two new officers with a property tax increase in the current year's budget. Um, Doug will talk a lot about how that goes, is working within their department, uh, but they're just in the process of being able to start to hit the streets uh, on their own here in the next month or so. Yeah, actually two of the three just got assigned to solo patrol this week and then we got one that just graduated from the academy. One of the two additional, so of those three positions he's speaking, two of those will be on the streets, or as a matter of fact, as I speak, so yeah. But we got one that's probably four months out, yeah. But you're seeing the impact of that just now starting to impact how your force can operate, uh, how you divide up the duties and and uh, be able to pro provide a little bit of relief to you and as well as some additional protection. Yeah, that and, and I'll go over this in great detail, but actually January 15th we'll be able to reassign a detective and that was a big goal for FY18 to make sure we could get another detective back up there that we, we used to have four, so we'll have that back. But over the weekend report, I was just reading that from Sergeant Zahn and they had six officers, two pop officers and two reserves. And I'm like, really, we had 11 cops sitting in the streets? This is fantastic. I never even imagined in my wildest dreams that we could do that. So it's gonna have a major impact on what we're doing. And like I said, I'll go over this in great detail in our operations, but it was, it was really good to see. Thanks, Chief. Under the next bullet point, just talking about the fire department, and I think that this will take some discussion as we move forward too with uh, Matt's, Matt's presentation. Um, you know, bringing on the six additional positions with a safer grant funding, uh, three year cycle for, for funds and it starts to stair step out um, just a little bit the second, in fiscal year 20 we see a little bit of a not, the same level of funding as what we have for 19. By when we get to fiscal year 22, uh, that funding's gone. Um, now, how do we? What are we going to have? Is it's not necessarily part of this year's discussion on the budget, but it does need to be some context for as we move forward with those positions. How are we addressing those six new positions? Are we looking to maintain all six? Are we looking to maintain three? Are we looking to go back to what are staffing was prior to the safer grant being in place um, or some other mixture in there. Uh, if you notice, I tried to put some background in there in regards to our relationship with the CTAA, whatever that stands for. Um, <laughs> Consolidated Town Combined. Combined Township Ambulance Association uh, so for our service for the majority of the county, uh, the cities and townships. Um, we have an agreement for uh, how we split funding on that between the ambulance purchases and uh, their percentage of staffing. Can you give me that again, Jim? No. <laughs> I cannot Goodbye, give you that. Goodbye, Township what? Ambulance Association. Is that right? I'm confused on the first seat myself. Huh? Why city? I think it's city township city, city town. because it includes cities as, as well as townships. Um, we currently now within that funding formula talk about the net net expense um, after all the ambulance revenue is accounted for we have 
some of the administrative positions, a percentage of their pay that goes towards it, and I think that the levels there are fairly appropriate. Um, the staffing that we have for operating the ambulance service may need some discussion as we move forward, and we brought this up at least with the uh, CTAA membership when we had our annual meeting with them a couple of months ago. Uh, the nature of what our service has been and the staffing it takes to make that ambulance service work has changed over time. The number of calls that, that are going on there, you're seeing, I think, Chief, about a 10% annual increase over the last three, two to three years. And then, uh, but since I've been here, I think it was in the 3,800 range for annual calls for service, and now you're more in the 4,900. 5201. So if you think about that, almost all of those calls are ambulance calls, the change in those calls in the last six years. Um, it, the, the level of staffing it takes is not to, to maintain an ambulance force for this area is more than having uh, four people per shift or two ambulance crews. We're operating very frequently a third ambulance crew. And as you look at what we're trying to do staffing-wise, having a, a, an ambulance stationed either at the West Burlington Fire Department or out at our public works facility in the evenings, it's reflecting the, the need to try to have a third tier to ambulance as part of our arrangement. Um, and I think that that's something that's up for, that needs to be up for discussion as we move forward. Uh, as the safer grant funding goes off, if we're going to maintain that level of service or in that neighborhood, we're we're going to need some participation from the CTAA that reflects right. the actual costs of <clears throat> operating the, the full ambulance service. Um, and, but it needs to be, as, as we have those discussions, I think it, it means that we need to make sure that everybody's looking at it from that perspective. Right. What is the true cost of operating an ambulance service, and are we adequately and appropriately putting per, the right personnel in the right spots? So that's something that we need to work through as we move forward. I don't know how much Chief will... I, talk about that or address that during his presentation but it's this isn't and again this isn't necessarily what this year's budget is about but as we move forward it is certainly part of the context of how do we long term make this staffing work right um, next point in their revenue streams that have seen some reductions I think I hit on that a couple of different times but Hotel motel tax capped at 990, 990,000 um, in fiscal 16. Um, we were down at 870 or somewhere in that neighborhood in, in 17. Uh, we're on pace right through the first, we only have four payments a year. We've only gotten one of those payments so far for this year. We're <coughs> about 12% below last year over year, um, which is what we've used as a basis for our, our budget project projections. I think I put that then at 770, maybe in this next year or so, uh, for what that base level is uh, for the current year and then moving forward into the next year. And I think that should be kind of the floor as we stabilize after a transition out of uh, what was going on with the uh, construction south of here. Um, we see that same type of loss of funding in the local option sales tax collections. Um, first three months, uh, or th first three quarters, calendar quarters uh, of the calendar year uh, 2017, uh, local option sales tax were 5% below the, the year, the previous year. Um, I don't know how that works through this full funding year, this full cycle um, in this year. But I do know that our revenues in fiscal 18 are going to be 400,000 lower than what they were in fiscal 17. Um, and we've kind of budgeted for that level to be the kind of onward trend as, as the base for what the future years are. But if you think about what that means to, from a year and a half ago when we were looking at what our funding was, we're about five to 600,000 annually less than what we were couple of years ago. Uh, the projects that were theoretically possible to talk about doing uh, that the rec mm -hmm. recplex or whether that's indoor or outdoor uh, could theoretically do the funding that we have available for the equipment replacement there for at the golf course within the parks within forestry. Uh, we use that to fund our 
police, fire, uh, th thought process with the local option sales tax, uh, half of that goes to property tax reduction. We use that to offset what we would otherwise be able to levy out of uh, for employee benefits. Um, the remainder of that, we fund a fifth of our patrol division, police patrol division out of there, and all of their replacement equipment. Uh, do we do the fireman's replacement equipment out of that? Fire department's replacement equipment outside of the pumper trucks has come out of that fund. So they, all the ambulances... Our portion of ambulances comes out of there. All of their other equipment comes out of there. Um, and we'll have some of, we've had some other projects that we've been able to do out of there. The depot, as an example, is being funded out of there. Um, we have less ability to fund some of those things. Uh, as Eric uh, was working with downtown partners on a future uh, facade. facade grant uh, for, we'd, we'd had that earmarked as something that we could do in, in Fiscal, I think last year we had it in fiscal 19's budget. We were looking to move that back to fiscal 20. Uh, it's not in it. We, we just had to com to eliminate that out of the, the budget. We What you're going to have presented is something that we can look to realistically fund over the next five years in, in, our, in our CIP plan. Um, it, it's going to be a lot less than what was in, la in last year's, and yet you're still going to see quite a bit that's being done. You got a lot of equipment, you've got some trails that are still being done. Um, Nick's side, as he gets to the, st the street work, uh, the majority of those things are, are still able to be done that were uh, otherwise contemplated. Um, but we do have, some, even his department, with the budget he presented, I made him cut uh, about 600,000 out. Some of those were energy efficiency projects that were funded out of lost. The majority of them were out of road use tax that we just didn't have the funding available to cover. And he can kind of address what, well, I don't know how much you're going to address that when you get to your budget. You're, you'll talk about the projects that you are able to get done. Um, is he, is Nick gonna, Nick's also going to cover the stuff that, that we had planned to get done and that we're not? Well, I mean, to some extent we can talk about, I mean, uh, some of the things, I mean, Eric, you've got so many things that have been cut out of this. I, I don't know that it's really behooves getting too far into the details of what we're not able to do. Um, last year, I think I had a list of that I included just at the bottom of things that we would have that were cut out just due to can lack of funding, to and we can do it again. Okay. Um, we tried. What we've tried to do is present the ones that are of most importance um, out of the funding that's available. Uh, and the departments themselves, as I went to them and said what we didn't have for funds, what we couldn't cover, um, I let them make the cuts. Now, in some of those areas, I said what I was just going to cut, uh, just just to try to cut out some interdepartmental um, issues going on. I'd rather not have fighting going on between departments for sure. limited funds. Um, and actually, when it comes to local ops and sales tax and how things were done, I don't think I cut anything for capital out of either police or fire, uh, just from the nature of what I think of being important for emergency services. And one of the things I didn't want Eric to do uh, when he's looking at what he needed to cut, um, don't cut too much equipment that puts you into a spot where you're now not able to operate the way you need to on a long-term basis. He did cut some equipment, but um, and hopefully it doesn't come back to cause problems. Uh, but we're trying to be cognizant of the fact that if you cut too much out of the equipment side, all you do is you you, you create a long-term problem that you can't yeah. that gets really difficult to overcome. Uh, I did mention the Apollo site. Um, do know, depending on what happens with that site. We took that over originally with the thought thought process that we had we're going to take on the responsibility for demo if we didn't do anything else with it. Um, you know that still sits out there as a potential liability. Now, we're hope, very hopeful that uh, what's gone going on there is able to be successful, but you know this may be that we're we're still sitting as a backdrop for that. And we had a I think an an estimate that wasn't high enough on on demo on that. 
uh, based on what we've seen on other things. I'd An estimate that was high enough. <laughs> wasn't high enough. <laughs> no, it was, it was and we high had, enough, all right. We <laughs> had it six or 700000 yeah. and I, I, I'll be happy if we end up being able to get it done for at that million? price. Oh, well, I'd be happy yeah. if we get it done for... So, just know that that's something that sits out there. And when we talked about it, that was something that we had looked at using TIF funds to, to make that project happen. And it's something that we still have the ability to fit in if we need. But it may, depending on what goes on, that may be something that's a, that creates a reprioritization of projects in the future that, that we're funding. Um, a reminder on the downtown project, we mentioned it already earlier. Uh, the need potentially to meet a, a parking lot need. Now we do have a source of funds with the second half payment from the manor site to cover it. Uh, that's right now where we're at. If, if, if that were to say this project doesn't happen at this current time frame uh, and we use that money from the manor sale to offset debt on something else and now you have a parking issue come up a year from now, no it's a different conversation to, to be able to have with that. Uh, timing means an awful lot. We do have the timing to have some flexibility for discussions at this point. Um, but we've got those worked out at least as in terms of we're building that into what our CIP is that we can address these needs if and when they do, do come up right now. Um, again, a year from now we hit a different cycle and it, we may be having a different conversation. It's always something with you, James. <clears throat> um, I mentioned the, the G was talking about the indoor recplex while well, we had the presentation. So that's one that we have that's sitting there. Uh, auditorium, you know, as, as we switch from one contract to another, uh, our relationship will be different with AMF than it was with Venue Works. We don't know what the, the net is going to be. Um, we do have it budgeted as the net being pretty comparable to what the net was. Uh, with venue works, uh, our cost with venue works over the last couple of years was in the 390 to 415,000 overall net cost to operate the the auditorium, and we have it budgeted in here for this next year. I think not, right in that 389,000 maybe for net cost to, to operate. It's it's in the same same ballpark, um, but the when it comes to the way that relationship is. It's a, it's a much different relationship. Uh, we, we made Venue Works whole uh, with the operation of their facility, with, of, the, of our facility. The, um, AMF, we're given a fixed amount to, and then we'll have some splits on revenue. But if they operationally aren't able to meet their targets, that's on them. So there's a different risk factor for AMF in the arrangement than there was that what there is for us. Uh, we also aren't going to be incorporating, uh, because of the nature of the different structures, uh, with Venue Works, uh, their operation for their unit down here at the auditorium, we incorporate all their revenues and expenditures into our books. We will not do that with AMF. We will show the expenditure of cutting a check to AMF, but they will be running their operations on their own. So it, it changes what our revenues and expenditures look like on our books. Um, Greer's Restaurant, uh, with the white boxing of that, the council had uh, approved putting up to $130,000 towards the white boxing efforts last year out of uh, the economic development portion of the local option sales tax. Uh, we've spent some of that money um, as we put in a sewer lateral across as part of another project. Um, but the, the remainder of our uh, funds will be covered by Nick and his budget presentation, I think, um, along with the 75000 we received from the Main Street Challenge Grant to, to white box off that space. Um, it still doesn't allow us to do everything that, that uh, everyone, I think, would like to do. We'll, Nick is right now in the process of trying to get some quotes for architectural and, and uh, construction services for that project uh, be, so that we can go about getting documents put together that li list out bid items. Um, but that's something that uh, 
were able to expand off of what was otherwise going to not get. I don't know. I've rambled. I, I'm everything I'm doing is rambling, but. Um, with this, we're doing more than what we would have with just our funding, but we're still not going to get as much done as what everybody would like to see get done. I guess is the with long and short of with it. The, with uh, the depot? Depot, primarily for the Greer's restaurant space, but this also, the way this is done, you're going to get the floor done outside. The bathroom? Hopefully. Hopefully. Well, and, and the reason why it's taken so long is one is why we went out for an arch, our HRDP grant. And so that had a time frame to sit and wait. And then we had a challenge grant. So if you start construction prior to whether or not, not you're getting the grant funding, you put, that, that, you put grant. that grant funding at risk. Right. And so we've kind of waited for these grants to be available. And so that's kind of the time frame. Now with this grant, uh, the, the challenge grant, there was, you know, with the funding levels that we had, there was going to be some obligation from Matt put on him to be able to take care of some of the stuff that we couldn't consider, um, couldn't get done with the 120. Uh, I think it was like 150,000 that I had projected that that estimate would be, and the funding levels were at 120, and that hadn't taken into consideration uh, design costs yet, and so those have to be factored in as well. So I think we're going to be able to get a lot more done than what we had initially intended, but it's still going to be tight. You're still working with a finite budget on this project. When when do you expect to be done with that project? Well, on our end. On our end. I would say you probably could see construction sometime starting in May. Okay. So sometime in the fall. Interior renovations always uh, right. interesting, but I don't know. The, the, the Great Room Depot project took probably six months longer than it needed to. Okay. So I would say probably six, eight months. One of the hardest things, I think, uh, even for Matt dealing with uh, this whole process, City with any construction project, uh, our time frame ends up being way extended beyond what uh, the private sector will do. Uh, we have to make sure that we use appropriate procedures for bringing on a, a, an architect or engineer uh, that meet our requirements. Uh, then we have to make sure that we do all the bidding in a way that meets uh, our re requirements as well, for, put on us mainly the state level. Um, Next item in here, uh, sewer separation work. This is going to fall under Nick. Um, get a nice cross between Don and Nick in terms of uh, how do we handle the sewer fund. Uh, the majority of the sewer fund Don will present uh, that needs to be funded out of uh, the sewer revenues, but Nick's work on this combined sewer separation fits into that same requirement and then maintaining uh, this sewer distribution system or collection, not, collection system. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you, um, <laughs> thank you. So one of the things that's happened with this CSO work, we had a this next the Mazel phase in what was designed to be uh, back in the early 2000s, we had a cost estimate for Mazel to be in a 20 to 25 million dollar range. Um, what we got back from a, a, a preliminary design work, uh, this locust basin at $5 million, that's the smallest of the basins. Um, it's going to be the first year project within the sewer separation work, and we budgeted out $3.5 million a year after that. Um, the cost estimates were in the $90 million range, absent engineering work, uh, which would put that total more in the $110 million range, or possibly right. a tad higher than that. Um, there's a little bit of a difference in, between the 25, 35 million and that 110 million dollar figure. A little bit. Um, it's going to be something that, even though we have the, we're building in that three and a half million or so a year work within our CIP plan. We are uh, in the process of we've we've had some discussions with DNR about uh, getting getting a willingness from them to delay the next phase that we need to do, which is submittal of a facility plan on the MAS portion of the MASL, Market Angular South um, portion, uh, until we can do some additional work. Uh, we've been working with uh, some contractors from the EPA on an integrated plan 
uh, which is designed to take a look at your whole system needs. Um, we brought on an attorney out of Des Moines to work with us even on that part. We want to try to make sure that they incorporate within that integrated plan looking at our overall more of our overall community needs what is it what is it, what does our infrastructure look like primarily what we'll also incorporate will be our street infrastructure and the needs that we have there uh, what it would take to uh, be on a, a true replacement cycle and what we can afford to do with the grant funding that we receive and the geo bonding that we do to make those projects happen um, we want to make sure that we build in as the EPA looks at that, then in turn, DNR, as they're looking at our CSO work that's being required, making sure that they're putting in the context of it, our, everything else within our city that needs done. Um, a lot of the stuff that Don needs done down at the plant with the lift stations along with the CSO work, um, potential nitrate phosphate removal and the studies that are going on there, uh, he's trying to get built into a, a master plan, which is why we Took, committed to spending a significant amount of money on that, uh, we wanted to make sure that that gets incorporated and all the needs that come out of that process are put in and we can try to layer and stair step all those different pieces and uh, go to the DNR with a justification for why we, we can't afford to meet the schedule that they've done and potentially change the philosophy that we have about what's going on with elimination of CSOs to having a managed amount of CSOs uh, to try to help to uh, get the costs into paired back on that work and then spread out over an extended period of time that that takes into account the rest of the work but that's a as you think about what gets presented within the, the five-year CIP plan for operations down there uh, there are a lot of moving pieces for what's going on and there are a lot more needs than we'll ever be able to get to which should be a familiar topic with a lot of things that are going on with the city. Uh, what we do and have continued to try to work on is having uh, rate increases in a 3% range, and that's uh, part of this budget is built off of that uh, ongoing 3% annual rate increase continuing, um, both in this, this san the sanitary sewer as well as uh, stormwater utility rates. Um, one thing that's going on too, uh, we're in the process of revising our rate structures uh, for both of those utilities. The first one that we'll be rolling out will be on the stormwater side, changing the way that we do our rates. Uh, primarily, it, I don't know how, that it's going to be a significant change in the way we do our rates, but we certainly will have some uh, entities who see some significant changes to what their bills are because they aren't we're not currently billing everybody where we were supposed to be billing them There's significant increases is that yes so as as we look at those we're going to see what we found in our system is is that we uh, are impervious surface area we have a within our ordinance structure a calculation that's supposed to be done not everyone's being charged as much as they are supposed to be being charged for stormwater for stormwater and part of this rate in rate study will be getting all of those corrected is and our goal is to try to have that done moving into this new year uh, we have talked with the chamber just to have them start to try to have some some discussions because it's primarily chamber members it's business and industry that have significant parking space it's really the primary places where that's mm. an, a factor um, but we're going to, we'll see as those rate studies are going on, the areas that we've asked uh, the, uh, I think that's BNK, that's the engineering firm that's doing them. We want to hold our main residential rate uh, consistent. So if we're doing the 3% rate increases, next year's rate on the re main residential, we want to see the that rate be next year what the current rate is plus about that three percent increase um, it may cause rebalancing in some other categories so you we, we there's no system that you can have a, a rate study done that you don't have places that end up with a significant change either pl plus or minus the water system just did their rate study and 
uh, they're having the same issues go on where you have some places that are seeing a major a major change and others that, that aren't. Um, it's nature of that process. It's not fun. So I think that kind of makes it through that section. Uh, major cost drivers. Well, seeing how employee wages and benefits are, especially in a general fund, or in the 75% range of what our expenditures are, um, they're the major factors. Overall wages are budgeted to increase 2.25% annually. Health insurance costs increase 5% annually. Um, pension system is something that had a, a significant impact on us this year. Uh, a year ago, uh, our projections for fiscal 19 versus where we are now, um, for fiscal 19, uh, pensions increase our operating costs by 100000 in the general fund. Um, IPERS had to increase their funding contribution from the 8.93% 8, 8 where it's been for the last five years to 9.44%. Um, MFP RSI, or municipal fire police retirement system, um, 411, Chapter 411 of the state code, increased from 25.68 to 26.02. And in, in the out years, there's a couple of years that they're projecting right now increases uh, a couple of years down, a couple of years up from that figure. And again, those the, the 411 system sees the number move up and down much more frequently than what the IPERS does. Uh, just the nature of, of their funding formula. Um, they're, they're just structured differently. Increases in this year, I think for both of them, uh, 411 increased because they changed their mortality tables. I think it might have been the same thing on the, or a comparable thing that was done on the IPER side. That they had a, a their, their investments met the projections, it's just they had, they had other changes that occurred that impacted the system negatively. Um, property liability insurance increased 5%. Non-union wages to match union contracts at that 2.25% uh, with a transition table. Uh, those that, for the transition table uh, allows uh, people below midpoint uh, to get caught up to midpoint um, the majority of our employees right now are when we since we redid the, all the salaries here a year and a half ago I thought we had are that, below the midpoint. I thought we had that squared away last year. We still uh, well, what we we redid our salary salary matrix for all the positions, and so we had a lot of people who pay ranges changed or the, where. What ended up happening is the majority of the positions were below the midpoint. So until you get caught up to the midpoint, you get a larger than that 2.25%. So you'll see employees anywhere from the 2.25% increase on the non-union up to 4%, 4 um, to get caught up. And, okay, and if you think of that in context of uh, our, the union positions, on the union side, you, would, you have tiers so that the, all, if you have three or five tiers, depending on the union, three, um, moving from one tier to the next as you, with years of service, uh, allow you to have a larger than that 2.25% to get caught up to the moving from more of an entry wage level up to the ongoing wage level. So the transition table on the non-union side accomplishes the same thing. Okay. Um, Gambling revenues flat. I already talked about hotel, motel, and lost revenues down. Uh, property tax valuations were up 3% from last year, which that was a boon. That was a benefit. It's higher than what our 15-year average is 1.7%. But if you think about the cost impacts that I mentioned up above, if wages go up 2.25%, health insurance goes up 5%, which compared to other plans, that's a pretty modest amount. But those are above what our primary funding source is. And at long term, that has an impact. Um, 
overall proposed budget expenditures in the general fund are only 0.75% higher than the previous fiscal or than fiscal year 17's. I wonder if that's supposed to be 18's budget and I just missed that. I think it's 18. Um, again, the salary primary factor benefits. pushing up is salary and benefits. Uh, it would be more than that 0.75% except that we took out of the double counting of, re of revenues expenditures in the auditorium. That, that muted what the increase would, would have been. Um, we'll see revenues <clears throat> expenditures higher in the fire department with the SAFER grant uh, and ambulance fee continue, revenue going up at a pretty good rate. Um, in terms of rate, other rates, uh, sanitation, or what do you call? Solid waste. <laughs> <laughs> Solid waste. Um, 25 cents uh, increase from 14 uh, a month to 14 and a quarter a month. And we've been budgeting that with a quarter increase each year, and we're looking at that projection-wise over the next five years to have that same deal. This is something that you're going to be hitting on during your presentation, but uh, we looked at, we've continued to talk about the potential to change our system from the tag system that we currently have with the 30 gallon containers to moving to more of a, a, a 65 gallon container um, that would eliminate the majority of the tag revenue. Um, the, we've got a couple of different goals that, that have been talked about, and this has been something that, from an operational standpoint of the department, uh, Don's group does a phenomenal job with with picking up trash. But the 30-gallon containers are those are that's a tough job, manually moving, carrying all of those. And the goal there is trying to is there a way to move more to a consistent container size? A larger container, but putting an arm on the back of the of uh, uh, the truck so you have a semi-automatic and it tips it. That arm tips it instead of having them to having to physically um, lift and dump each of the containers. Now, there it's not as if they're going to get away from the physical nature of it, but it's designed to try to reduce the physical nature of it and try to reduce the number of injuries that these guys go through because they. They I get a lot remember, of significant wear and tear can, on them. I can't remember a time that I've been on the council that we haven't had somebody busted up. So, and I'm serious. I, I just wonder how much money that we've spent. Not only that, but I can tell you firsthand the insurance premiums for automated trash collection systems are significantly cheaper uh, than for non-automated. Although with our system, it doesn't quite. Now, I'm for, sure, I'm sure. for so for how our work comp works, we have a, a high deductible work comp, so any major claims, we have a stop loss, but we self-fund our work comp otherwise. Our overall cost for work comp, uh, $350,000. If we were to look at a, a work comp policy for our employee size uh, and, and payroll, I, what I see from comparable communities is twice that, yeah. what the, that they're spending on work comp. So we do, we it doesn't have the same impact on rates because we don't go out and sure. shop at the same the, re the, the rates are very telling in regards to the number of injuries and, and the hope there to try to help save our, our forces bodies. Yeah. Um, I'm, <clears throat> on a side note, I'm concerned what would happen with recycling if we went I to was, those larger containers. That's, that's gonna, and that's one of the concerns that Don has continued to raise as any of these discussions go out. You have, you, you're, going, you're go not gonna see, see the same level of recycling. We're, we're fairly sure of that. You'll still, you'll still see recycling, but it won't be the same. I think what really we need to think focus on is ahead. actually um, penalizing more waste while we, not even rewarding, but making recycling less of, not less of a hassle, but you know, you have to pay for your recycling container. Granted, you only have to pay for one, and then you can put out your own Jeff, little. Jeff, steals it. Or, yeah, or that. But um, I feel like this is just going to encourage more waste. And what is going to cost less in the long run is, is um, 
recycling. One, because you can sell recyclables. And two, then that in itself is another, there's less for those people that have to deal with lifting the trash. And I think we could probably find ways to increase what it costs people to throw things away. So well, the other thing, side of that, though, is by going to a larger container, we would probably see less trash-related nuisance claims. This is uh, doing the like other that. part of what we've talked about long-term. And Charlie has probably been the lead on this discussion um, mm. because our nuisance department deals so much with uh, loose trash, not just loose trash, but uh, going to a place and finding a garage full of garbage. Now, you're not going to eliminate that, but you will limit the amount of that. Part of the what happens with trash being collected is the base garbage is left out and anything over and above collects at, at different places. That's one issue. The other is just the nature of the 30-gallon containers and then extra uh, bags that are left out and just wind coming up or dogs tearing it up uh, creates an issue. And having a 60-gallon container Part of the, the goal there is to try to have less of those nuisance issues occur from those other factors. Would that be the limit? Would they only be allowed one 60-gallon container? Because I mean, I'm, that's I, a discussion that we have to have. Now, another community I was in, um, we use 90-gallon containers, and that's what I've been more and, exposed to. And uh, I'm proud to say that we were able to somehow in that town make it with one 90-gallon container. We had um, we had people. I wonder that, what he was doing to make that happen. Recycling. We, yeah. we well, had other. Well, we, our kids were younger. Um, we had other. I think that we did a base charge on that. We did another uh, like three bucks for a second, and another dollar fifty for a third, dollar fifty for a fourth. And we had like one person who had four ninety-gallon containers in town. Um, that would be closer to what we are now. Um, and then is that build on? I mean, we we add that charge so to the water bill. So you'd have to be added in that. You'd, you'd have to figure out how you're doing that. Um, that would, I think, be part of a discussion um, about if you were to implement that system, how to how do you go about it? Uh, we in our system, you s would t sign up for a subscription. So if you're saying I want one, you're gonna. You're going to have your one. Price. You're going to have the base price. If you want a second one out sure. there so that you can have the flexibility, you're going to pay the monthly ongoing cost for that. So just like, uh, so I have a Levine's trash or a yard bin in my house. Every, time, every bin I have is X number of dollars. And then Correct. To the service. Uh, and just to tackle your recycling, I actually used to live in a community that had a 90-gallon bin uh, for trash, and then they had a 60-gallon bin for recycling. And if they came to remove your trash and there were recyclables in there, they wouldn't take it. So you you had no choice. If they went to pull your trash and there's milk jugs in there or boxes or things like that, they won't take the trash, wow. um, thus pushing it back another week. And they'll tag it and say that your you bin buy, contains yeah. recyclable, uh, uh, recyclables and we won't I pick like it up that. until it's been removed. <laughs> um, now that's kind of going above and beyond. I also lived in another community where if you did it, they would fine you. Um, I don't know if that's the direction we want to go, but there are there I are. I think there are definitely steps we need to take, and as soon as possible. There are things that we could do that would encourage more recycling, um, and also uh, provide a better service and help limit our exposure to the work comp claims that we've experienced um, from a trash uh, from a trash collection standpoint, solid waste collection standpoint. So, as this discussion goes on, that will that's a precursor to what. Fun we will have when Don presents Woo! the base budget. Well, that the base budget that will be presented there by Don will be based off of the idea of continuing our existing system. It okay. does add uh, one full time position within that uh, to try to help address the issues that we have with, with understaffing. Um, that would limit to some extent the amount of uh, outside labor that we contract through temp labor. But it wouldn't alleviate it completely. It, it would limit it some, but not completely eliminate it. We can work that in within the rate structure that we've been operating under over the last few years and are yeah, looking to, to work under over the next few. Don will also look at what a budget would look like to implement the 65-gallon uh, containers 
and it cha it does change the structure, and, and that is a point where th that's designed to be a, something that you don't necessarily have to have that occur during this budget cycle. Um, and you certainly don't want to hold up approving a budget based off of that, but it you may this this I, I, there's a lot of conversation that wants to go on with this group on this and and it may spur some thoughts about what are some different avenues that we need to explore as we move forward on that. Good. Yeah. Um, already mentioned sewer rates. Again, that's 3% annual increases. Um, one thing within the hotel motel, uh, we did have a, we've traditionally funded over, well, long term since I've been here, we funded the Art Guild and the Symphony on Burlington Municipal Band uh, sporadically and then more of a, on a permanent basis uh, for funding out of that at the levels mentioned in there. Uh, we had a request from the Capitol Theater for uh, 20000 out of that same fund and they were looking at that as something I think as an ongoing thing. I don't have the funding to make the things happen that need to happen uh, that we're already committed to. Um, I, I just I can't recommend covering that request. It's not built in here. If, you you're uh, talking about Capitol Theater. Yes. Or are you talking just about the all capital. of them? Just the, just the Capitol. Yeah. He's talking about just the Capitol. Yeah, 20,000 for them. Um, I, I can't find a way to, I mean, in a different scenario two years ago, uh, that request would have been uh, easier to at least look at. The level of funding that was being requested, I'm. I don't know that I'd recommended it com in comparison with what other groups are getting, but this is just not the context for bringing on additional funding. Uh, True. Um, police department, just as last year, uh, as chief presented uh, a scenario for what you could look for transitioning staffing levels there, um, there was some from you know, the, the discussion came from the council about wanting to look at bringing on six additional folks. Um, Chief did not want to bring on six additional folks, even if that was something that you would have actually looked to find the prioritization for funding to make it happen at that point. Uh, just from a terms of um, bringing folks on and being able to adequately train them, along with our, our the kind of turnover. You, probably have about two people a year anyway uh, that are retiring or moving to another department or whatever goes on that need, need to bring on. Um, he looked at a plan if you're going to make that increase in staffing of six folks occur, two per year was more what needed to be done and he can address that topic during his budget presentation. The budget is not based on adding anyone but that discussion about whether you want to continue that plan that was brought forward last year uh, and bring on the next two in that cycle and the, the associated equipment can be brought up. Uh, again, I think I wrote a little bit about it. Notes, but something that Chief has brought up, you start bringing on additional folks and, and having a, if you do continue to add more people onto the street, it impacts uh, everything that's associated with it, the calls for service, that the calls that are getting answered, the reports that are generated from that change, what it takes to just to keep up with the processing, everything that's involved with that. And so you, you have some byproduct, potentially staffing needs if you continue to go down that road. And Jimmy, I've got to back up to, uh, because this is new to me, uh, back to 4A and the Art Guild for $12,250 annually. I don't remember giving the art guild kind of money annually. They're listed, they've been identified in your, uh, see one thing that will get presented later on in the process, you'll see a list of everything that's funded for out of hotel moto tax. They've been listed every year for the last five years. Um, it's something, and I don't know how long that's been going on that they've wow. been funded out of there, but it's, it's something that's been funded for since well before I was here. Before we say absolutely no to the 20000 for the Capitol Theater, and I agree with you that now is not the time for necessarily new um, requests for funding, but do we look at the, the benefit that that brings to the community from either an economic standpoint or from a revenue standpoint? Um, are they any 
large projects or any large fairs or, or events that are bringing in revenue um, that we need to take into consideration before we absolutely say no to that type of product or type of request you if you want to do something that, that's different you certainly can I, I just we don't have enough funding to cover yep. the other stuff that's going on. I, I just could be adding something new okay so well, I just want to say moving forward that I, I think we need to look at the 12250 that's going to the art guild. Uh, I'd like to get some information on that because I certainly don't remember. Uh, if you would like them to uh, make a presentation, I don't know if you have it, who you communicate with Stephanie from there. We can have them make a presentation as to what they do with that during this process at a work session. I think that would be appropriate. And kind of already mentioned Reclex. That's something that the changing operations there and usage has changed over the last few years. Um, Eric will make sure to uh, touch on that and uh, what's going on out there and um, some things that they're looking at to try to address address it and still I mean it's still an operation that it's phenomenal use it's just not the same thing that it was 10 years ago and what we again we changed what we funded in there from the 40,000 level to the 75,000 in this year's budget to filling in at the 110 growing to 140 over the next five years and it may not take that but it's fundamentally different than what it has been in the past for what we need to, to put in to make that operate. I've talked about as much as I should talk for tonight. I thought you went above and beyond, Jim. Oh. But. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. I do want to put up one thing. You'll address what's in the, the booklet, which is good. Eric, the last page of your, what I gave to you. Yeah, I think so. It has the, the bottom of that. Mm -hmm. I put the top so you can see the, what it's doing there with the headings. So we don't do five-year budgets here. We do one-year budget. Uh, but as, as I put it together, we do the CIP plan is based on a five-year basis for primarily for what happens with local option sales tax, hotel motel tax, road use tax, and the, what sewer needs to make sure it is looking at its revenue on a five-year basis. But we do it with the general fund, too, uh, looking at our existing operations, um, the staffing levels that we have in the different departments, the revenues that we are bringing in, uh, what we're looking at and cost factors uh, we assume a right at that 2% CPI factor for most categories we build in the wage increases we build in um, benefit increases we look at uh, what's going on with our different revenue sources gambling state the gambling revenue for example stays very flat um, we build in about a 1.8% annual increase on property tax revenue which is the 15-year trend. Um, and we look at what's going to happen long term. So now we don't, look. We don't have that page. No, you don't. Okay. That's why I wanted to show you this. Um, you get to the bottom of that here. What I do is we plug in the, the revenues and expenditures. Um, if you look at our, it shows here the beginning fund balance going into next year at that 2.8 million level. The budget for next year, we've got budgeted to gain right at 50,000, uh, which keeps us at about the same fund, fund balance percentage, uh, right at that 14.7%. We enter the year and end the year uh, at 14.7%. Um, but out years, we go from a that 50,000 positive budget to 150,000 deficit to a million dollar deficit over five years. Is that a result of the so, 
This is just the general fund. So the main factors that hit that, uh, we have safer funding for six positions. That safer funding goes away. We have funding in the police department for two positions. That funding goes away. And then you factor in um, a long-term process where your revenues historically haven't grown at the same level as expenditures. Um, that exacerbates it. Um, just the positions, just the positions would have a, a grant funding to go along with it. Uh, is I guess I didn't do that, but off the cuff is in the half a million dollar range, going from having the positions as currently funded to no grant funding for them. Uh, the the rest is just a growing spread between revenues and expenditures. Um, our existing staff can be moved forward. Uh, where we're at right now, we can address and handle, uh, but we hit a, we, we are going to hit a spot where we have to deal with what are we going to do different, whether that's collect more revenues, um, whether that's uh, change our, our uh, personnel structure, or, or what. There's something that will have to be done to make this happen over the next couple of years. Again, that's not what is on the line for this year, but as you make decisions, you got to think about what the long-term impacts are. The, fun, the positions that we brought on, just maintaining them has a long-term impact that will have to be addressed. And in two hours here, an hour of me talking is all the more that anyone can stand. Um, did you want to kind of talk about what you've put into the binders and so everybody had binders so each week um, at the next meeting we'll have the detail of the police budget and then we'll have the detail of the five-year CIP so you'll have handouts at your station each each time we meet and you can add to your budget binder so I'm just saying maybe you know bring it each week and put it in um, the first page of course is just the calendar of um, all the meetings we have scheduled Jim's report and then we ended up putting in a special report for the budget it gives a good overview of different aspects of the budget um, that's some reading and then just we have um, the next one is the comparables of our rate property tax rate to other cities that's in there we wanted to share that with you and if you have any questions um, and then we show the gross revenues of the general fund, gross expenditures. And then the last schedule is showing um, net of by department. And that combines the revenues that we get in for that department against the expenditures to show the two, true cost of that function. So if anybody has any questions on these, um, Jim, your 0.75 was compared to 2018. So okay. that's where that you can see that. And we also broke down the percentage, um, you know, of the general fund that makes up each of the different functions, fire, police, culture, and rec. Those are, um, does anybody have any questions? I know um, in the packet we also included, um, I should be in here to skip over that, didn't I? Where yeah, we did some definitions. The fund structure overview and basics of accounting and budgeting. A lot of this is put on yeah. us. I mean, you have it here, GFOA, Government Finance Officer Association, puts a lot of structure on it. But the state of Iowa follows the same type of structure. It requires us to break our revenues and expenditures down into different categories. Um, we do encourage you to make sure you have at least a general understanding of, of what we talk about buckets. Money comes into one bucket, and you have to account for it in that bucket, and you may use it to help fund something else. Now you're doing transfers between buckets. And states really um, has a system that makes it difficult to track of things, and it's confusing. It's bad enough that you're dealing with a $75 million budget. Uh, we make it a lot more complicated and hard to track. Sweet. But if any has, anybody has any questions, feel free to contact me. Um, if there's anything else you want to see in here, any, let us know. But it will fill up as we go through these next weeks. You'll you'll see the detail of everybody's budget as we get ready to present them. And any questions? And you see the 
you know, some of the other stuff that's in there. Um, you do have material that was in the council packet that encouraged people to look at. It's a gen you see the, what we're presenting for general overall expenditures within the general fund and revenues in the general fund. There's also a sheet in there that compares to the other towns over 20,000 population to give you an idea of where our tax levy sits. Um, keep, in, keep that in perspective. We are a high tax Thanks, levy too. community. Um, as you make decisions, remember the impact it has on that. That is one of the key drivers that looks that economic, from an economic development perspective. People look where they're going to live, uh, where they're going to work. Uh, those are factors that, that have a, a big impact on it, along with, though, at the same time, quality of life. So how do you make sure that you keep them in balance as we're making these decisions? What's West Burlington's, do you know? A lot lower. No, I don't. I don't. If you want to look, in fact, anybody that wants to look at a community, Department of Management's website has, you can go uh, into their local government section, um, and you can look up any community's budgeted information. You can look it's at it over. It's apples and apples, though. It's, right, uh, absolutely. Well, but it does give you an idea, and that's where I, all of the information I did went out looking at the Department of Management's website and taking a look at those those comparisons. I know. I'm just saying there. some communities, they, they do their financials different and all of that, yep. too. So. Mm -hmm. uh, radio. Wednesday. I can do it. Nine o'clock. All right. And see you then on Thursday at three thirty. All right. You guys, uh, any closing remarks, Mr. Tesla? No. Nope. Peanut butter popcorn. Um, consider signing up for the Citizens Academy if you haven't. That's Thursday evenings. I can't tell you exactly when it starts, 5.30 to 7.30. And I'm thinking about signing up. So I think it's a tremendous way to learn about how your city operates. All right. You heard it first. Johnny Billups. Uh, I, first of all, thank you, Jim, for, for breaking down some of the technicals. Again, kind of awesome. I appreciate as there's three three people or of us that are new and also the public at home. It's kind of nice to have those broke out. So the other thing is great job of the city staff. Once again, the ice storm, I got around town just fine. Couldn't call in sick. So thanks a lot for that. <laughs> uh, and that's it. I couldn't call in sick either. So thanks a lot for that. Um, yeah, I, the, roads were, the roads were great in Burlington. I had trouble navigating other cities' streets, which was surprising considering the proximity. Um, also, um, this Friday is Battle of the Brushes, which is one of my newest, most favorite events at the Art Center. Um, it was really fun, crazy time last year, I love the first year on it, so I'm excited to see what happens this year. It's Friday. Um, I'm not sure if there's still tickets available. I guess you'll have to go down and see, but I know it, it sells out pretty quick and, uh, it turn people away, so get down there and check it out. It's only ten bucks. They also have an art hop for kids. And there is an art camp day for Friday because I know what I do. So it's fun. All right. That's all I have. Your 50 kids can have something to do that day, Jim. <laughs> Mr. Ranker. Uh, I don't have much. Uh, Chief Baird, uh, obviously, you've announced your retirement, I'm assuming. So uh, just thank you very much for your, your all your hard work. And um, uh, just echo what you had to say earlier. Uh, it's been working with you and shop with a cop, and I know what you, the effect you've had on the community will be felt, felt for years to come. Uh, and uh, Tanner just really messed the Hawkeye. Great article regarding the fire that occurred in Burlington years and years ago. Uh, found it very entertaining, so that was it. Yeah, I just wanted to officially say that, that probably the first week of April will be for me. And it's, uh, <clears throat> it's been wonderful. I mean, it's 30 years. It's a long time, but when I talked to Jim and he offered me the job as chief in 2012, you know, I kind of said then it'd be five and a half years. You know, it's a lot. It's a lot for your family. You know, and it's just time. It's just time to take a break from law enforcement and, and go do something. Work hard for us, chief. I mean, and, and 
and I'll have some more things to say at the, obviously at my proclamation for retirement, but I just want to say thanks. You know, I look back to 2012 and where we were with 38 officers and the fertilizer plant, and I mean, it was, it was a real struggle for the organization, and we made a commitment to change our culture and how, how we go about policing in this community. And, you know, we, we arrested new people that we have probably more. I wish it wasn't that way, but it is, but we do it with dignity and respect, and that's something that we're really proud of. So with that said, it'll be the first week of April. I mean, you guys got a lot of decisions to make between now and then, but you got got some months here to get that done, and I'm here to help you through that process if, if, if that's what you choose. Uh, the building will be substantially complete by then. I mean, there's going to be some trim work. There will be some things going on down there. I mean, the schedule's probably now the first week of May or so before we can start actually moving in there. But by the time the first week of April rolls around, it'll be in a position that we'll know exactly where we're at with the building and the budget, and it's something that I promised the community they made a commitment to us. And that budget will get done, it'll get done within budget. I'll, I'll make you that promise. I said that years ago, so we'll stick with that. So thanks for everybody. We'll uh, have a little bit more to talk about. Like I said, as as time moves on here and as the process gets started, I know Mr. Fernando will have a process. I don't know if that's after I leave, or, but I'm here to help you with that. I've made a lot of contacts within the industry, so I've got some great people to bring down here to help you assess candidates or whatever you want to do with that. That'll, that'll be entirely up to you. So, like I said, I'm just grateful. I'm grateful. I'm very fortunate. I'm blessed to have a community like Burlington, that's for sure. So. We're grateful for you, that's for sure. So thank you. Thank you. It's not That's some part of an elaborate April Fool's Yeah. I tried to talk him out of it. He wasn't having any, so, uh, yeah. Hey, uh, one last thing. Uh, citizens, yes, we hear you. If you're listening, uh, we'll check in to see why Mediacom's not broadcasting the meetings. So. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Nothing else? We're good to go. James? this up and uh, we'll see you guys in a couple of days. Thank you.